Let me start off, Christian McKay, by asking you the, a really blunt question, and that is, do you think that Orson Welles knew what a monster he was? You know, this he's a fascinating guy because he's genius, and we allow our divas to be uh, diva-ish because uh, they need to get their way if their way is brilliant, but this is a man who clearly crosses the line. And do you think he was aware of when he did that and, be, you know, and then went into the monster zone? Uh, well, I, I turn the question on its head. Do you think any of us are aware <laughs> of our bad behavior? That's a very good uh, perhaps counter, those, counter response. You know, perhaps in those uh, the, the uh, witching hours, four o'clock in the morning, when perhaps later in his life he was eating pots of caviar and drinking uh, wine and all the rest of it and, and expanding, you know, by the hour. Perhaps then he looked back and, uh, with, with a, a certain amount of uh, regret. But, um, you know, in terms of the movie, I thought, I didn't want to be an apologist for him, but I thought that, you know, his neck was on the line at 22 years of age. He, it was his own theater in the cauldron of New York theater, you know, uh, with limited funds. And, uh, you know, he was responsible, he and John Houseman. So he had to get the job done. He was the boss. And when you get, um, when your authority is questioned, uh, then the snake might bite back, you know? Mm -hmm. He's just, he's a, one of the great tragic figures of Hollywood. Here's a man who had all this think promise. So? Absolutely. Here's the man who was, the Mercury Theater did all these brilliant things there on radio, uh, made Hollywood dropped to its knees when he made Citizen Kane, which is still, according to the American Film Institute, the greatest movie ever made, and then burnt out. You know, tragic, I, I don't know. There's the what-if scenario, of course. But when you think that he was working in an expensive medium with his own funds, using himself and his glorious gift, that incredible voice, one of the greatest voices of any century, to sell dog food and frozen peas and wine and sherry, whatever it took, and then taking the money from that and putting it into his independent films as the godfather of independent films, the true independent spirit. I don't view that as tragic. I view that as a man of obstinate integrity. Your movie has taken a bit of an Orson Welles journey of its own. It's a film that <laughs> you faced great struggles getting made, and then it, yes. it seemed to sit on a shelf for a while and then seemed to come roaring off the shelf once it hit the film festival circuit and film critics loved it. And now it's being released, uh, has been released during the, you know, in that Oscar alley so that we're taking it seriously as an awards contender, and you're up for Best Supporting Actor, and a lot of us are cheering you on. Um, Thanks, Tom. Do you, do you think, do you see any parallels between this movie and, and, and Orson's quest in making movies? Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, I, th I think that the, I've never made a movie before. I'm a, a musician originally, and, and then as, uh, after my graduation from RADA, um, I, I worked principally on the stage. And... Um, the first thing, when I met Richard Linklater, I'll be absolutely honest with you, Tom, I gave him the names of famous Hollywood stars who could play the role, thinking to myself that he can't cast an unknown Englishman <laughs> who's never made a film before. Um, and, of course, I was thinking even then, you know, of, of, of you know, him getting the money to make the film in order to, you know, get the chance to tell the story. But... Richard, of course, the first connection with Orson Welles is that um, he goes to Europe <laughs> to find the finance for the film. He would have made it in America, of course, but um, some rather large, you know, rather grand producers, of course, in Hollywood, they turned around and said, get rid of Limey. <laughs> what are you doing? Who the hell is this guy? You know, and uh, Richard insisted on, on me. Of course, I'm forever grateful for that and giving me this wonderful chance. Now, of course... I've learned so much on this journey, this wonderful helter-skelter roller coaster ride. Um, but of course, now in, in uh, that I'm overwhelmed being nominated for awards, you know, with my first film. Um, we're an independent film, and I'm representing Orson Welles, who's always been the underdog. 
and the spirit of independent filmmaking. And as I walk around L.A., and I see the millions and millions of dollars on advertising and posters and wonderful, beautiful ads, you know, for your consideration. I like to think of the parallel with Orson as in this age of conglomerates and superstores, being a, a humble representative of your friendly local neighborhood grocery store. <laughs> I think that's a very you know. apt analogy. That's nice. And I'm a very proud proprietor of it. <laughs> I really am, with, with a, team, a team of friends that I absolutely adore. No money, but, you know, but uh, uh, some, a piece of work that we're incredibly proud of. It's also quite noble of you guys to cast Zach Efron in this movie and to bring Orson Welles to that whole generation. You know, that, that, that's the genius of the casting of this movie. And, of course, he's very good in the movie. He's, he's done what he set out to do, which is make that crossover from, from popular films to serious films. And what you've done by bringing him in, giving him that chance... Uh, Not me. Is, I, I have nothing to do with me. <laughs> well, Rick, 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 Richard, then, Richard, is, yeah. is, is, is uh, you know... Do, do you think that a lot of the people going to see the Zac Efron movie have any idea who Orson Welles is? No. And I think that's, a, that's an incredible thing. You know, that extraordinary celebrity that he commands. There was a 12-year-old girl came up to me in, in London, and she just read Julius Caesar. Wow, and I said, at 12. I said, why did you read Julius Caesar? She said, oh, I don't want to miss anything in the movie. <laughs> you know. And she said, uh, I sat through Citizen Kane. She said, it's very difficult. And I said, ah, right. Well, I said, I, you might appreciate. She said, oh, I loved it. She said, but that's a 12-year-old girl who Zach has introduced to Orson Welles and Shakespeare. Wow. I think that's, I think that's incredible. I, I'm, I'm so proud of that, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's hope he, let's hope Orson doesn't introduce her to Paul Masson wine too soon. Uh, <laughs> It, it, in a way, it's a shame. You know, late, later in his life, he became known for those those wine commercials because they were he ever present. Got paid present. a lot of money, though. Did they? Yeah. He got paid a lot of money, and um, you know, like I say, he he put that money into his independent filmmaking. Uh, what what are we to think about him as a stage director? Because that's not captured on film, but but it is in this movie, of course. Uh, he had done a. Uh, what was it, an all-black version of, uh, what was the other show? The, vo the Voodoo Macbeth. He was working for the Federal Theater Project as part of Roosevelt's New Deal. Right, okay. And John Houseman was heading the Negro Theater Project. And at the age of 19, he'd seen Orson on stage playing in um, uh, the Catherine Cornell, Guthrie McClintic production of Romeo and Juliet, and he thought he was incredible, John Houseman. And they got on very well, and he gave Orson the opportunity to direct the black actors in um, uh, the Voodoo Macbeth. There's a wonderful story about that, because many of the actors claimed, you know, Jack Carter, who played Macbeth, for example, had never read Shakespeare at all. He was a prize fighter. And Orson taught him at 19 years of age how to, um, how to speak the verse, and uh, what uh, the meaning of Shakespeare. It was an incredible, one of the greatest successes of his life. So successful, in fact, that the cops had to rope off four blocks around the theater on 7th Avenue. Harlem folk were fighting for 50-cent tickets. And it was such a success that Orson left the curtain up at the end so the audience could come on stage and congratulate the actors. It got fantastic reviews, apart from one. Uh, which was a guy called Percy Hammond of the Herald Tribune. Now, these people were real voodoo <laughs> practitioners and, and witch doctors. And Orson was leaving the theater one night. This uh, Percy Hammond of the Herald Tribune wrote a very um, pompous and snobbish uh, critique, saying, you know, very racist about black actors performing Shakespeare. And one of them said to Orson as he's leaving the theater that this man, Percy Hammond, is a very bad man wrote us a very bad review. We put Barry Berry on him. And Orson went, oh, that's great. Yeah, sure. And as he was leaving the theater, he started to hear them go, bum, 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 bum. And so the drums started and everything. And um, the day after, Percy Hammond was in hospital. And he was dead within 24 hours. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Orson used to say, are there any critics, well, it's telling this story, are there any critics in tonight? You know, because check out your life insurance. 